Mike check. Thank you all for coming. This has been a beautiful week. ETHCC is a very special event for me. In the first ETHCC, I was still a student. I had zero money. And ETHCC gave me a 250 euro student ticket to come to attend. And that was the beginning of it all. So big thank you to the organizers. <laughs> Last year, I presented Foundry. Foundry is a developer tool that many people in this room maybe use, maybe not use. We don't call names or families. We love everyone. Today I'm here to talk about REST, a new REST Ethereum node that we've been building at Paradigm for the last, since November, October. Over here in the screen, before I get into any exciting slides, you're seeing a few things. Etherscan on the left, and a node running on the right. On the top, Tmux panel, you see a lighthouse node. On the, sorry, on the bottom left panel, you're seeing a lighthouse node. On the top one, you're seeing a ref archive node singing at the tip. On the bottom right, the ticker that's going up is not some countdown, it's not some bomb, it is the block number going up. And on the left, we're seeing Etherscan. So let's start refreshing Etherscan and see what happens. One, ref goes eventually to two, and so on. So we're trying the tip. It works. Holy fucking shit. OK, let's talk about it now. Wanted to give this as a sign that we're going to talk about real engineering, live in production, that we put a lot of hard work into. Paradigm is a building a new Rust Ethereum node. Rust is built to be modular, contributor friendly, and of course, blazing fast. It's built in the Rust programming language, which is a language that empowers developers to build fast, efficient, and reliable code. I don't consider myself a great programmer, but when I discovered Rust, my life changed. And I hope that many others will too. You will find some links there, our chat rooms, my Twitter, find me after for stickers, etc. And the person that stole it from the cafe, we will find them. I don't know what the right pronunciation is. We make decisions by, not consensus necessarily, but by, or by committee, we have different opinions. I call it Wrath. Anybody is free to call it whatever they want. Well, again, we won't hold anyone to any accountability here. In this talk, we're going to talk about why, what, when, what on top, and what's next. And I hope that this is going to be an informative talk and one that will hopefully pave the new wave of Ethereum infrastructure. First and foremost, we are all Ethereum developers. And what is happening is that the world is changing. The world is evolving, and so is Ethereum. Here we are seeing Vitalik Buterin's very famous or infamous roadmap for Ethereum. The Ethereum roadmap involves more and more and more and more. Complex and simple. Yet, time is finite and things are happening and we don't have infinite resources. We also like to have client diversity. Why? Because the Ethereum protocol is built in a way that if 66% of the validator set which is now running an execution node, suffers from a critical bug, or yet worse, is compromised, the network will finalize a bad checkpoint. And that is catastrophic. So it is critical for the Ethereum network's health that there is no node that has over 66%. There was a very noble work by Prism where they literally encouraged people to run competitive nodes. That was beautiful. Um, the goal of Wrath is not to overtake Geth or anything else. Peter's team is the team that brought us all here, is the team that gave us jobs, you know? So Peter's team deserves all the support it can get. We're not going to be number one client. We'd be happy with number two, number three, 
whatever. We want to provide a new wave of Ethereum infrastructure. Here's like the thing that actually bothers me though. This is how it should be. There should be a great code base with great abstractions in the middle and everything plugging onto it. Instead, we have this. A lot of people maintain get forks, some better, some Frankenstein, some you don't want to see them ever again in your life. We want to get out of that business. We want to get to a world where instead of having endless forks, we have some, perhaps, because it's going to be hard to agree, of course, on one thing, but some varying implementations with clear abstractions, clear interfaces, clear tests, clear benchmarks on every one of these components that can be mixed and matched to build new EVM-centric infrastructure. The thing that bothers me actually the most, though, is that people think that this is hard and that this is something special that only talented people do. That's not right. That's not how it should be. However, um, this has been a system that has been developed for a long time. And uh, as the protocol has been evolving, like, we cannot always do the best engineering from the beginning, and we cannot always figure out the best abstractions. We have deadlines to meet, and you know, and we have families to meet, and you know, not everyone can be over the node 24-7 to make sure that the person like me, like five years later, will be complaining. So, you know, no shame, yet we want to see, can we do better than this? Performance is something that I deeply care about. Archive nodes are a critical piece of infrastructure for the ecosystem, and most importantly, they allow everything to work. Every piece of historical infrastructure, indexers, etherscan, anything, anything you can imagine, literally, that has some notion of historical data needs an archive node. Archive nodes do not need to be expensive and slow to sync. Archive nodes are a piece of technology that is critical for the future of the industry. Secondly, the rollup centric roadmap demands more performance on, on the edges. Current nodes can support more performance because contrary to what one might say, it's not the CPU or the whatever that is bottlenecking you, it is a state growth. And the state growth is the big enemy here. However, one could say that let's try to do better in this vertical also. And I will not talk about the third and the fourth bullet point. It's kind of obvious why these are useful. Comes to that question then. So that is all the motivation so far. So we spent like eight minutes talking about the motivation. Let's talk a bit about the principle around how we approach the problem. We thought we went to the drawing board and we said, what do we build? I thought, let's do a node. And on the node, like, I'm not a node developer. I don't know anything about nodes. I didn't know anything about, no, anything about nodes until we started it. I know DevTools, though. So we're like, OK, let's give it a, a fresh look from the DevTools-centric way. So we built REST to become very modular, very easy to consume, a thing that can become the backbone of the new wave of Ethereum infrastructure. We also want to give back to Ethereum. Again, Ethereum has given me everything, and I want to give back to it, and this is like hopefully one small contribution. So to the meat of the conversation, Reth is an Apache MIT licensed Ethereum execution layer written in Rust. It is driven by the open source team that shipped Foundry and is going to be shipping a lot of many great things. We have some people from the team in the audience, Roman, maybe Alexi as well. And I want to spend a minute to talk about our culture. The culture is open source first. It's inclusive mentoring, and fully async. What does this mean? That even though we have a core team of very, very, very strong engineers, the most talented engineers I've ever worked with, we have no ego. We talk to everyone in the community, and we mentor them hand to hand. There was one guy like, that said, day one, journey of learning Rust. And uh, we jokingly said on day three, Red contributor by day 10, and he was a contributor by day eight or nine. It's real. The Rust meme, turns out it's happening. Beautiful. 
The async first component is something that I learned from working at Paradigm on the investing side, which was something about having very, very low tolerance for noise. The synchronous communication is like a mutex on your calendar, while everything should be flowing like a channel, like an async stream. So our culture is like heavily built on async written communication, very clearly communicated, low we go, close every feedback loop. And that is what truly enables us to build great software. We're not geniuses. It exists. I showed it at the beginning of the presentation. This is running on a big box. Feel free to hammer it right now. Open an issue if it breaks. That is how we operate. We share our code. We're not afraid to share experimental code. We invite people to test our experimental code. Foundry infamously was on nightlies, still is and we screwed up the V1 release. We'll talk about that another time. We have a Grafana board here, which has all the Prometheus metrics exported by the REST node um, that you're seeing above it. And the current tag is Alpha 4. It got released on Monday. I'm going to talk about the new releases in the future. So what, right? Um, so eight people stood up a new node in eight or nine months. We have 100 plus open source contributors of various size. Obviously, it's very front-loaded to us. But like what we want to do is that we want to make, create the next 200, 300, 400, 500 core devs. You know, not application, not smart counter devs, core devs, people that will make the Ethereum ecosystem anti-fragile and real for the long run. The node has a very attractive performance characteristic, which I'll talk about in a second. It has basically full Ethereum JSON RPC. Here I have a link to a tracking issue that my colleague Matt Seitz created, which basically is a checklist of all the RPCs supported, and has support for both Geth's debug tracing, rewritten from scratch in Rust, including the JavaScript tracer, which some people love, some people hate, I hear, and the Parity trace module, following the spec, well, no spec, but like following the initial implementation like as much as we could, actually. And the last bullet, like I'll talk about in a second. 359 pull requests have been merged in the last 30 days. 135 contributors, 2,000 stars, four releases. The first eight devs in this picture are named Matt Seitz, Roman Krasuk, Oliver Nordberg, Dan Klein, Dragan Arkita, Alexis Shekirin, and our unknown Joshi. They're the best Rust team I've ever worked with, and a big shout out to them for dealing with me on a day to day basis. The feedback loops couldn't get tighter. Maybe not. We want more feedback. Please give it to us. Be on that list. People are starting to get hired out of our code bases. People come into our chat rooms and they snoop. Competitors hire out of our chat rooms. We give it for free. We have first look on the, on the best ones, hopefully. I will not name node two in this uh, slide. There's no point in creating uh, any conflict. And the upper numbers are a bit easier to measure. The lower numbers, there's like some nuance, and I don't want to be too strongly opinionated. The numbers, what you see up, is the at block 17.4 million. That might be a month ago. You get it. It doesn't scale that much, like in a month. Reth achieves best-in-class syncing speed. We tested on Latitude, on bare metal servers, on Samsung Evo devices with very, very high IOPS. That's the bottleneck when you're sending a node. So we chose to use the best hardware to get the best output. And I want to caveat that for less good hardware, the gap might be less big. But we're going to work on keeping it like, to be as good as it is now. The database size, I think, honestly, the difference with the Ergon DB doesn't really matter. Like, if you're like, at that much, like, it matters like, to be on the order of magnitude. You know, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 16, and so on. Get a nethermind, they have the try structure built in to the database, which means that they incur significant overheads for historical nodes. Caveating that this comes at trade-offs for like how well you can operate at the tip. We're trying to do both TBD, if we'll be able to do both. The initial goal for us was to build an archive node, and we're talking about archive nodes today. Just want to be clear. 
On the slides below, there's three things, and I will explain how these charts were generated because we take a scientific feedback loop driven approach to all our charts. Um, you see a throughput chart, which means that input, output, one request in, one request out, breadth scales linearly. Success rate means that you keep hammering the node and it keeps responding successfully. Notice how it is not any small number, it's 16,000 requests a second. It's a lot. Latency matters also for any customer. So it also performs very well there. Um, for the people that we'll ask later, the spikes, we don't know yet what they are. Like obviously latency should be going up as you're like um, increasing the load. Might have to do with caching, and might have to do with other things. We're still investigating how to get, make these charts better. Any data analyst or data scientist or somebody that's very experienced in load testing, please reach out. This is made possible by a tool called Flood that my colleague Storm built for Reth. We were like, we need to get numbers for this. So how are we going to do it? It's also hilarious. Storm builds Flood. Like, like that's his real name. Um, so Flood is a tool for load testing nodes at the J-curve inflection point when latency and throughput start to come into contrast with each other. And that's the only place where you need to measure. The only thing that we need that we know how to do it, like this open source project, is measured, measured, measured. Anybody that doesn't test at the J-curve inflection point of the thing is giving you false numbers. And that's why we build a new tool. And that's what I'm trying to also get to here, that like we didn't invent any new algorithm. We didn't do anything crazy. We had good abstractions. And um, we just applied good software engineering principles from scratch. You know, that's how. Profiling and benchmarking, the feedback loop. Big shout out to Ergon for the stage sync architecture. It really opened everyone's eyes to what can happen and to the flat DB design, which we have deviated at this point, but still a big part of it like has overlap and like they're like the the, the, the best people that like could create this. It's built on Revan, which is the library that Dragon Rakita, like our colleague built, which is also the AVM that powers Foundry, and I think all of MEV infrastructure, or anyone that's serious about it um, today, and the Rust programming language. We apply a defense in depth approach. Uh, I'm realizing I have seven minutes, so I'm not gonna go through all of these, but Swiss cheese model of security, you go through everything, you apply everything that you can, standard security practices, you know? If you thought solidity auditing was like something, do this. The action item from like this group, this audience, is help us make the node great. Currently, Ether nodes tracks 20 nodes. I don't know if that's the case. If it is the case, we gotta do better. Um, but we don't have telemetry, and we have no way to find out more about it. We're happy to handhold people. We work with Latitude, who will be creating a one-click deploy solution, and we also give discounts to people to run on bare metal. Literally, if you start seeing a node on Latitude right now, call me in 50 hours and we have a node and we can talk about it. Cross-platform priority, very, very important. We also want to support ARM devices, we want to support any device. I studied Leica engineering, I care about my Raspberry Pi. You know, and the hardware, the only thing that matters is the disk. Less cores on the CPU because we're doing a single-threaded process, which is the EVM. Not fundamental, I will talk about it in a second. Memory usage, 16 gigabytes, we're gonna make it lower. It's not fundamental either, it's just more tuning. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Now, let's open up a bit the design space. We've talked about the node, but we've said it's modular. What does modular even mean? The node is the first application. We're building EVM-centric infra, and we're creating great abstractions for it. This is what you can do with Reth. And not just that, this is like the entire crate. Red has like 30 crates in it. Every crate is carefully designed, careful interfaces, careful tests, careful benchmarks for everything. It's built to be hacked on. And I will do a community showcase just to show how powerful this is and that I'm not like selling you anything. So why are we extracting data over JSON RPC when we have a database available to us locally when performance is important? Why? are we not talking to the file? Like, in, it's, like, it's like spinning up a JSON RPC for SQLite. Are you kidding me? 
So these guys, um, Van Beethoven and his colleague, who I forget his name, a uh, big shout out, they went and built this, Ethers Red. So Ethers RS is a library that I wrote three, four years ago for like uh, Ethereum in Rust, of course. And basically the one key takeaway to have here is that like on localhost, HTTP, IPC, which itself you would expect that IPC forking would be like giga fast. And then you do it directly to the database, you get another 2x, 2 to 3x. That's not trivial. You're like 2 to 3x over something that's already super optimized. Like people are going to make money off of this. Python rest the bindings. So you know, we're Rust maxes, sure. But like Python is amazing. And like the same thing that like happens in NumPy, for example, where NumPy calls out to C code under the hood, we want to do here. We want to have Python bindings for the entire Reth ecosystem. Any concept that exists in Reth should be that ideally has to do with data science, because that's like one core segment that we're after, should be using some Python bindings. This is like very POC, but we want to like have something that's good. Um, some people like thought that this statement was a bit strong, but basically we have a benchmark. So there was uh, Joe Stevens who works at Aave. He hacked it on a weekend without any input from us, a REST indexer that talks to the database directly and achieved incredible results over what uh, many people in the industry use. And again, don't want to be causing any conflicts, but uh, you know, numbers talk, and I hope that this is something exciting and that we can all like, start using more of it to make all our infrastructure better. This is something used in MEV. We don't need to talk too much about it, but basically we have high quality inspectors that are used for how this, to operate the node, and it also does this. Um, again, MEV, I don't know if we have any builders here. We have an amazing trade abstraction um, and no access to builder code because that's proprietary. Like I don't even have access to it. But basically, if you're considering building a builder, we have a good abstraction that's let, that lets you like, build it just by thinking about the business logic. I have a buffer of transactions. I need to order them in some way. I need to pick the best bundle of all. Like, not a, again, not rocket science. This is like pretty nice. Um, P2P entries without having to run an entire node. Pretty powerful. You can expand your P2P coverage. I'll speed up a bit because I'm running out of time. Red RPC is also reused, same thing. And now let's talk a bit about what's next. Stability and growing the, the contributor set. Um, Self-explanatory, we want to create the next 100, 200, 400, 500 core devs. The next feature that we're going to be shipping is uh, the RPC calls, uh, sorry, is the um, pruning and full node. So right now, Red is an archive node. We're going to become also a full node. Why validators? We want validators to be able to run it without needing like a three terabyte database because two terabytes plus like Lighthouse and R200. EVM parallelization and I optimizations, contrary to what people might tell you, are very possible. We have solid ideas. We're going to work on them. Um, Cancun, we're starting to work on it August 1st. We actually have a ref offsite this week where like some of these things will be scoped. And we also started working with the base team and the optimism on OP ref, and we also hope to have something on this by the end of August. I don't know what prod ready means, so I went on Twitter as any lazy investor would do um, and ask how, what does it even mean? You know, Peter said the right answer. Geth is production ready. Geth is the crown jewel here. So we have a high bar to meet. How will we meet it? performance improvements, by making sure that the database doesn't break, by making sure that we can keep tracking the tip reliably, the list keeps going. If you have ideas on how, we can call it prod ready, and we can have data-driven, not narrative-driven, data-driven things to call it, please reach out. Thank you. One question. Okay. Who is the confident one? Uh, hey, uh, thank you for your talk. I uh, just wanted to ask, uh, when you were implementing RPC for Red, 
So you said like you try to be as close to the spec as possible, but how uh, can you share how do you like? What spec do you use? Because like currently, if you use Ethereum API spec, it's uh, like lacks a lot of methods. And uh, from my experience personally, if you want to understand what RPC currently have, what capabilities RPC currently have, you, the only way is to go to you know Aragon source code or get source code. Do you have some kind of your internal specification that you try to maintain? No, it's a lot of work. We want to contribute to execution APIs and specs because as you're saying, it's a problem. We indeed um, have to, like Geth is the spec sometimes, you know? Um, that's fine, Bitcoin Core is Bitcoin spec, so I don't really mind. Uh, it does make the job a little harder. The good thing about the Rust programming language, I will stop after this, is uh, that um, if we define the types well, we know we find the spec deviations very easily when we peer with others. So. Like in Ethers, for example, like when somebody, when we integrate with like five different RPC services, everybody would go off spec, they wouldn't even put like JSON RPC ID in them. You know, so like stuff like that, like we catch, but yeah, it, uh, acknowledging it is a problem. No, we don't have a great internal process. It's a lot of work. We also use Hive for cross client testing. So, of course, like we try to, if we all pass what they pass, probably good. Thank you. Done. Thank you all.